<laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the December uh, business meeting of the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. My name is David Armenti. Our chair and vice chair are um, unavailable today to uh, lead or participate. Um, so I'll be steering the ship here uh, alongside uh, fellow commissioners. Uh, so please bear with me if, uh, as we as we fit these pieces together. Um, thank you all for being here this morning and into the afternoon. So uh, first and foremost, um, as we uh, come into the Google Meet, uh, we want to take attendance uh, amongst the commissioners, associated staff, as well as uh, members of the public. Um, so what, how we typically would invite uh, members of the public um, after we take our commissioner attendance. So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and start there. Um, is Joy with us today? Doesn't look like it. All right, I'll, I'll just run. I'll just run through the the attendance then. So please just announce uh, if you are here. So David Armenti, that is me. Iris I'm here. Barnes, I'm here. Iris Barnes. Uh, Lindsay Baker. Here. Good morning. Simone Barrett Williams, Michelle Coles. Here. Good morning, Michelle. Nicholas Creary. Present. Good morning. Roger Davidson. Maya Davis. Tisha Dupree Wilson. Chris Haley, I know you are here. Hello, hello. Elizabeth Hughes. Present. Good morning. Amy Millen. Here. Good morning, Amy. Uh, Isetta Mobley. Carl Snowden. Present. Good morning, Carl. Good morning. Marshall Stevenson. Stephanie Swareth. Present. Good morning, Stephanie. And Good forgive morning. me, there, there may have been individuals who um, expressed to the chair and vice chair their, um, that they would not be attending today. Uh, that information didn't necessarily make it to me. Um, so I only have what uh, what's in front of us today. Uh, and it looks like we have, let's see, 10 commissioners in attendance, which I believe, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that should put us at a, a, a quorum. Yes, That's Will. Correct. All right. All right. I only see eight, to tell you the truth. Uh, let's see. Me, one, two, three, four. I've got, I've got 10 uh, based on who I just wrote down, including myself. Uh, So I think we're good there. And uh, so again, uh, members, either members of the public or associated staff um, or members of the public mainly, uh, we welcome you to announce yourself in the chat if you so choose. Um, we are we are very appreciative of of your presence and and participation here today.
And David, just I, I think we, we learned over the weekend, or at least on Friday, that Zeta Bombardier is no longer with Reginald Lewis Museum. So that's so that's one less that we have currently. And we know we don't have any Sorry, I heard another. Did I hear another comment? No, that's that's correct, Chris. Um, so maybe I don't know if that maybe officially goes on the record and in some way um perhaps that's a new business i'm not i'm not sure but i'll i'll record it nonetheless um so we can we can follow up on that uh component uh thank you to those who uh announcing themselves in the chat um again appreciate you being here today uh, so moving into approval of business meeting minutes, um, I believe that at this point um, we are still waiting on the uh, reviewed uh, minutes of November. So I think I think we decided that was something because we didn't get a chance to get that out to uh, the commissioners. So that's going to be a we're going to table that request until next month and review both both monthly sets of minutes at that time and so next next on the agenda um, we have public comment uh, which again I believe we've we've traditionally um, had that uh, come through the chat, um, or if individuals had any uh, particular announcements um, they wanted to make, um, other than other than folks on the commission. So we can we can leave some space here for that. All right. Well, feel free to again. Feel free to chime in um, in the chat um, if there are either new pieces of business uh, from members of the public or things to support um, the conversations that we're we're having here today. Um, to add on to that, uh, Chris, would you mind setting the stage for for the soul check? Okay. <laughs> we started this several months ago, a few months ago, which is just so that those of us who are commissioners, and certainly I, I think we'd welcome members of the public to, to contribute as well, uh, just to get a sense of reminding ourselves wh why we're here, why the commission was formed, all the matters of social justice and injustice that are going on in the world today and in our country, to allow ourselves the time to just share our feelings and in that sense, uh, in a safe space, again, remind us of what our goal is, what our purpose is, which hopefully will infuse us within this this hour to two hour period that we're talking about this this important topic, and also to help energize us as we move forward to schedule forthcoming hearings with with goal and purpose as to why we're doing the hearings and what we want to be shared there, which is in and of itself a uh, even a more broader soul check to remember those souls who were lost, which is why the the commission to to recognize the lynchings that occurred here was formed. So within that, anyone who who wants to participate with the soul check are free to do so at this time. Well, I'll just I'll just say that. Obviously, we are in the quote holiday season, which, in many cases, requires us to to get together with our with our family and and folks of potentially opposing viewpoints and such, um, which can be a challenge. But I think it's also an opportunity. So I'm I'm personally, you know, looking at that as a you know an encouraging factor. You know, get us together. Uh, family, community, otherwise, and and I hope that other folks are taking advantage of that. So, even if it is having, you know, productive, if potentially divisive dialogue, um, that's that's what we are about as a commission, and you know, practicing that in our in our personal lives. While it can be, you know, heavy and challenging, and I know I can I can attest to that. 
um, it, it allows us to flex that muscle and, and hopefully move forward. Cause sometimes saying nothing at all is, is, uh, what allows things to, you know, snowball. So take, taking this holiday time to, to, to be productive and, and promote dialogue. Yes. Uh, Lindsay. Hi, thank you. I've only listened to the soul checks, not talked. So, uh, hopefully I'm doing this right. Um, yeah, similar to uh, Carl's note in the chat, um, just the ongoing genocide that's happening in Gaza is at the top of mind for me. And today is a worldwide call for boycott. So I was trying to balance like, what is the work that I'm doing at Maryland Humanities? What is its role in trying to create the world that I want to live in? And how do I balance that with do I not work at all today? Um, and so how do I also allow my team to know that they can choose not to work today? So I decided that this was the type of thing that was, you know, exactly what um, this type of work is important in building the, the world that I want to see. So I'm here today, but I just wanted to note that others may be thinking about the same thing. similar on a similar note I um yeah today there was kind of a worldwide general strike plans and I'm wondering how different cities are handling that um different workers and what they've chosen to do um I learned over the weekend that uh in Gaza the uh, an archives building was destroyed which is such a tragedy it's such a tragedy um i've been mourning the the loss of information that is that comes about through this kind of destruction and there's yeah there's been a lot of that happening on this planet a lot of information loss um through uh warfare and it is absolutely awful the stories about people's lives that may never be able to be told in different ways. And that makes me really sad to think of history and culture and art that is being destroyed right now as so many different people are suffering. It's a weird, it's a weird time. It's a weird time to be witnessing all these things. It's difficult. Iris. Hi. This is uh, Michelle, mm -hmm. oh. Michelle Coles, and I, I just wanted to pick up on the storytelling aspect that I think is so important. Um, you know, throughout time, everyone's stories have not been shared and disseminated equally. And I think it is it's so important to be able to um, look back and try to capture the stories of the people who, because of their marginalized position and lack of power, um, their stories were not recorded and they weren't told. And so they they don't they didn't carry through to our present understanding of what people's lives were like. And so what I'm just really excited about being on the commission and working with the commission is excavating those stories that have long been suppressed and forgotten and giving them <laughs> giving them a platform. Um, so that it can expand our collective understanding of of what makes up our, our present moments and what is necessary to achieve justice. This is Iris. Yeah, one of, one of the reasons I get in, got into this work, museum work and uh, his historic work and um, the commissions and uh, trying to make sure that these, as as was previously mentioned, making sure these stories are not lost, but you'd be surprised, just general public, how the general public is not aware of so many events or so many stories, often tragedies, of course, but also the ways in which people have triumphed or persevered through those incidents or 
or uh, the way society has the disparities in society, but also besides getting the general public at all ages, but to really, um, I think it's important we start with the youngsters to get it in their my hearts and minds, an understanding and an awareness of why certain things are the way they are today. And before they get brainwashed the wrong way, to bring the truth forth, to bring the information forth so that they can see it all. It's not some stories or we choose, of course, you know, to some degree we're interpreting, but to make sure all these stories are out there for them to see and be aware of and to make some life decisions and uh, based on that, based on these truths. Thank you. Mm -mm. I appreciate everybody taking the opportunity to, to share their thoughts. Um, I think, you know, this, this really, Hits home, hits home the the reason for the soul check that it's not you know it's not always just about the work that we're doing but um, you know checking in on ourselves and and making sure that we're we're reflecting on on the purpose uh, and things like that so thank you everybody and if there you know if there are relevant resources um, you know pertinent to the to the commission or that sort of adjacent thinking and work, um, those those can also be shared in the chat for our reference. Uh, on to, so if nothing else there, um, we're on to committee reports. So do we have uh, committee reports other than uh, myself, um, I can I can share about uh, research, but do we have um, Nick? Do we have any uh, particular report from the um, your committee? Uh, no, no reconciliation committee report at this time, but hopefully that will be changing soon. Thank you. Uh, we have we have had the opportunity to meet as a research committee uh, both in November as well as last Monday, December fourth, uh, which was uh, primarily comprised of commissioners as well as um, associated staff from the state archives and the Office of the Attorney General um, and our uh, collaborators at Heritage Associates um, who lead much of our research efforts. Um, so I'll, I'll pull out a few highlights of that. And, and I believe the, the plan as well is to share the, the notes or minutes from, from those, uh, what are hopefully monthly meetings, if not bi-monthly meetings, depending uh, on the frequency we can get going. Um, <laughs> And those will, as of, as of this time, we have them set as monthly meetings. So the intention is to do the first Monday. Uh, and that's clearly next month is not going to be January 1st, which I believe is the Monday. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to acknowledge that and, and move that date at some point, which will be indicated on the website. But uh, regardless, looking at our discussion from last week um, and Chris, Hannah, whoever, uh, please feel free to, to jump in and, and supplement or, or correct um, as I'm talking through some of these updates. Um, but the Maryland State Archives uh, reported that um, they have some uh, folks on their end that are work continuing to work through the governor's general file at the State Archives, uh, which covers 1890 to 1980, 
uh, and that effort is uh, adding to some of our related case studies and, and perhaps even revealing information about new cases. Um, so this is, this is again part of that effort to mine existing data collections and um, digitize more material that can be linked to case studies that are hosted on the Maryland State Archives website. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to say about that, Chris? Sorry. No, I think that's really where we are right now. We're, we're trying to, to confirm when, which serve members will be with us for the first two months, which is be January and February, and then the next two months, March and April, and then the other, uh, other interns that we're also looking at at uh, working with as well, which we'll certainly will certainly report back to the commission. And I think it's also worth stating, you know, we've we, we've kind of talked a lot about over over the years about incorporating students and volunteers mm -hmm. into the process. I think this is a really good example of, you know, a focused project that has clear output for the work that we're doing as opposed to just saying you know yeah go comb some newspaper archives let right. really you know focusing on a particular collection that we know to some extent it might be a needle in a haystack but it's inevitably going to reveal something about the conversations um, in this case at the state leadership level about events that that may have occurred so um, again kind of thinking about how we incorporate um, external support, particularly among students, we, we can we can look to these models um, and hopefully do a better continue to do a better job of that moving forward. Um, so al already within that, um, and again, Hannah, feel free to jump in. I'm kind of regurgitating things that you shared last Monday, but um, that's already revealed some references. Um, not just within that record group, but also uh, continuing to review newspaper archives. Um, there has been additional information or at least additional primary sources about at least one of the Harford County um, cases, as well as a, a reference to an attempted lynching, uh, I believe along the Harford County and Baltimore County border. Um, so yeah, continuing to review record groups um, and then kind of taking that information and adding on to our existing case studies or you know having that for more discussion um, so I don't know Hannah you know if you wanted to share anything more about that particular reference that you mentioned yeah that was pretty accurate David thank you um so basically my process has been perhaps, yeah, you know, I'll say like try pronged on one prong. I'm interested in exploring attempted lynchings that happened throughout the state because I believe firmly that um, these are important to include, um, at least in like the body of knowledge we have about this particular kind of violence in Maryland because um, the cases that represent these murders that were carried out are not the only instances where this kind of behavior on the part of citizens of Maryland happens, right? Sometimes mobs are planned, uh, lynching parties are organized. They don't always successfully carry out their awful deeds. Sometimes they fail. Sometimes the police are able to uh, foil their plots because I think this is also a story about state responses to um, violence kind of refining over time and surveillance becoming more uh, efficient too. So I think that studying uh, attempted lynchings is important for just kind of tracking uh, instances of uh, this kind of violence, um, even if it doesn't succeed, um, because that's, uh, that's important to me. It's not about the bodies only, it's also about this, this kind of behavior in the state of Maryland on the part of some citizens that did not necessarily begin with our first case and did not necessarily end with our last case. So that has been a 
lengthy process so far, but uh, a fruitful one of, yeah, combing through newspaper archives, uh, archival resources. Um, another thing I've been doing is kind of going through the, uh, the resources for existing case studies we have, um, the Maryland State Archives, uh, Judge Lynch's Court's online resource, and just kind of reading through them, see what I can find on the subject of that Harford County case you mentioned. Um, so there is a, a lynching case of Isaac Moore that we are all aware of. Uh, one of the newspaper articles that is attached to this case study as a resource has a, a brief mention of another possible lynching that could have happened um, on the Harford County and Baltimore County border. But it is unclear if that is referring to a different case that we are already aware of, or if some of those details were incorrectly reported in the Baltimore Sun, which does happen from time to time. Sometimes people forget dates. Um, they get the year wrong by a year, um, the month off by a couple of months, and that might be what we're seeing there. I'm still exploring it. Um, yeah, I have a lot of patience for this kind of reading, so I'm still trucking forward. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, yeah, um, if you're going into the realm of attempted lynchings or almost lynchings, um, you know, again, I came across a, you know, the case of Stanley Moxley in Washington County, 1901. Um, he was in, why am I blanking on the town? I can see it as I sort of go across I-70, um, Hancock. Um, and, you know, was, again, typically, you know, so, uh, you know, bait, well, turns out, you know, was in a consensual clandestine interracial relationship. Uh, the woman turned on him, you know, accused him of assault. Um, he was, you know, they got him out of Hancock down to the, to the county seat in, why am I blanking on it? But they got him out, you know, before, ahead of the lynch mob getting there um put him in jail for three months and then had the hearing you know testimony came out you know that yes they were in fact in a relationship and he was sentenced to i forget how long but he was sent to put in prison you know i i always refer to him as the one who lived um you know but i've got some information you know there's information on him in the baltimore sun but there are also documents um in the archives that I was able to find, you know, sort of, you know, at least, you know, sort of detailing, you know, sort of the, the results of the trial. So I can dig out that information and, and get it to you. Um, but again, that that's just kind of one of those cases that stood out, you know, for me is showing that, yes, it is possible, it was possible for people to prevent or to, you know, to manage to avoid the lynchings from happening. Thank you. Wow. I would, did you say Stanley, Stanley Moxley? Stanley Moxley, M-O-X-L-E-Y. 1901. Um, yeah, 1901. Um, yeah, I am not on my private computer right now. Otherwise, I would just dig it up, um, but I will, I will get that to you. I'll take the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's very interesting. I, yeah, I'm very curious to read about that one. And just for the record, quickly, the, the purview of the commission does not, quote, cover attempted lynchings, but obviously, if we're attempting to understand the community, you know, it's a part of the story, you know, so it's not to say that that, that information obviously has value, um, but those would not be individuals that get put on kind of the official list of victims, so to speak. So. We, we definitely want to, you know, continue to pursue them um, alongside the kind of official exactly. uh, victim list. Yeah, Thank my you. hope is that this would be a state archives kind of initiative and perhaps some of the uh, information could augment what the commission is doing, particularly because perhaps like some of the police officers or possible participants mm -hmm. in these criminal activities could be connected to commission cases. So. But yes, definitely, it's not under the commission. <laughs> All 
Michelle. Michelle, did you want to add something? Sorry, I forgot to press unmute. <laughs> I, I was saying thank you, Hannah, for this this work you're doing. This is great. Um, I have kind of a similar, uh, slightly tangential line of inquiry um, of things that you may be seeing as you're doing this research, and it might be helpful to keep track of, particularly as we uh, when we start turning our attention towards the reconciliation component of the commission's work. And I was just wondering if you ever come across information about um, the loss of land that um, that maybe corresponds with a lynching and the theft of land or um, people abandoning their land out because of their fear um, of, and intimidation of what has happened. And I just think that could be another um, line of research that would be great to keep track of as you know, as you're looking at the lynchings, because it, it may inform other parts of the commission's work. Oh, that's a that's brilliant. That's something I had not really. That's wow. Hmm. Thank you. That's a great idea. I have seen that actually. I can think of one case uh, where a family they they left the state of Maryland. Um, that's a wonderful thing that I will make space for in my spreadsheets. Displacement. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Definitely appreciate that recommendation. And I think, um, you know, Dr. Chavis's work around Wacomico County communities is a instructive example of that. And I'm sure that there are other situations where, where we need to pull out that thread more for sure. And, and I'll also say, you know, based on what, what Hannah was sharing, um, we did discuss in the research committee that, um, Dr. Barnes being the um, Harford County representative and, and liaison, uh, if there were specific questions to uh, touch base with, with her amongst others to kind of continue to pull that out. So um, that can be another follow-up step. And uh, Dr. Barnes is with us here today, um, but we that's something that uh, can continue over email um unless unless there was something else to share about it at this time i welcome any questions and uh contact me feel free to contact me uh, at morgan iris.barnes at morgan.edu thank you for your work hannah And okay, so uh, further in the research committee, and I'll, I'll try to wrap this up without uh, too much more. Um, some of the focus of the case study research, as well as genealogical research, um, some of the areas that have been uh, some of the most recent uh, focus, Frederick County. Uh, Calvert County, Prince George's, and Harford County. Harford County was already mentioned um, since we did have that discussion last Monday about some new materials that we would revisit uh, reports that were prepared or materials that were prepared uh, in 2022 um, in the lead up to Harford County's um, EJI soil collection event that uh, Dr. Barnes so so well hosted a uh, really wonderful event um so you know just again cross-referencing research that's already been done uh by multiple entities uh to hopefully add on and, and have a a full as full possible story to tell there um frederick county there were uh several updates on the genealogical side um as well as opportunities for descendant outreach so that's something that we've that's been a continuing conversation with um heritage associates is when there is a likely or potential descendant to connect with and 
either get more information or discuss about being a part of a hearing or being a part of the reconciliation process. Uh, again, making sure that uh, it's not just our associated staff or contractors that are reaching out, but in many cases, it will make more sense for either a representative of the commission leadership or the office of the attorney general to do that outreach um, so that that conversation continued within the research committee. Uh, so again, working with um, the chair and the vice chair to make sure that we have the right voices in, in making it feel official um, and also letting and having the right supports in place uh, for folks that will, you know, take that step of of collaborating with us, um, which can be which can be a challenging process, of course. Uh, also, uh, was mentioned at least for one of the individuals, um, a record group that is of value, and and this would obviously intersect with the state archives and and potentially other repositories are utilizing um, state penitentiary records. So whether it is perpetrators or victims, um, recognizing their intersections with the law enforcement community prior to the crimes that we're studying, which can actually reveal things about their either family background or connections to the community. Um, so we, we had that recommendation uh, for at least one of the victims that supplemental information could be found in that record group. And so again, there, there's maybe a little bit more detail about some of the lines in the, in the research work, um, particularly coming out of Heritage Associates. So that um, I'm happy to share more about that, certainly in the next research committee meeting, um, but also by email and the ongoing um, effort to compile primary and secondary source material. So Hannah and Chris spoke to it from the state archive side. We also work with our external collaborators to collect that. And ultimately the, the intention is for that information to funnel to um, the case study stories um, that are hosted on the state archives website. So I believe that is most of what I have now from the research committee update. Uh, again, feel free to connect with myself, Chris Haley, um, if you have questions or updates about particular cases um, or, or the lines of, of inquiry that, that can be followed to support. And I do see a few comments in the, the chat that we should uh, lift up. Um, Eleanor Thompson acknowledging attempted lynchings in Anne Arundel County um, of the Holland brothers and a, a mob that attempted to um, commit a crime against them. And Hannah taking note of that, uh, as well as about uh, the family of, of Mr. Thomas Jerricks. Uh, thank you, Reverend Teichert, for, for sharing that uh, information as well. And Nick, Nick Creary, Dr. Creary, following up on that uh, Washington County example that was mentioned. Uh, so moving into, and I think I think that's it for our committee reports, unless anybody has anything else to share. All right. Moving into new business. We do have, um, as far as the project manager position, uh, so the, and if, if anybody is here from the Office of the Attorney General that, that would have 
um, any more specific information than I do, please feel free to uh, chime in or uh, supplement what I'm saying. Uh, but my understanding is that we're in the process of onboarding a, a new individual into that position, which again, the project manager is largely um, a staff position to support the coordination of public hearings, um, as well as some other tasks. So very, very essential as we are moving toward um, scheduling more public hearings and getting all of those pieces together. Uh, so we have an applicant who's accepted and is in the process of being onboarded. So hopefully we should have more information soon. Uh, yes, Sophie, please. Hi, um, so we have a tentative start date of December 20th. So we have to start at the start of a pay period. So we selected the earliest start date, which should be next week. Oh, I meant to take that off. So I assume at that time, um, maybe next, so next week, there will be more to kind of circulate amongst the commission members. Yes. Yeah, so once she officially uh, joins and gets on board, I will send an email introducing her to all the commission members. Um, we have some materials that Stephanie uh, Thompson made, Thomas made. So I'll provide her with everything. And um, if anyone has more materials that they can share with her, that would be helpful. Hi, we have a question in the chat. So maybe, Sophie, if you could go on. No, the so uh, Jordana, she resigned from the commission um, effective immediately. So we circled back and the person that we did hire is, um, she was the second finalist. Um, I mean, they both were amazing candidates. So. You know, I think either way, the commission will be well served with either candidate. So, Lindsay. Hi, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you could provide a little bit of context for for me and maybe anyone else who's new to the commission on the staffing structure, um, how that that works. My understanding is. The commission is a standalone, right? So are we supported by staff that run through the OAG? How many are there? Um, that would be helpful for context. So um, somebody else can jump in if they have more familiarity, but it's my understanding that it's just the way the statute was written. So staffing is provided by Bowie State University, um, the Office of the Attorney General, we, were, we are here in the capacity to provide legal advice and to issue subpoenas as needed. The project manager, that is a contractual OAG position. Um, they are a direct employee, contractual employee of the Office of the Attorney General, but their sole purpose is to provide support to the commission for these uh, projects. We also have a um, procurement out to hire an outreach person. Um, that person will be funded through the procurement process. Um, see, Kristen has her hand up, so she may be able to provide more information. No, sorry, Sophie, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, I, I had raised my hand just in case um, you wanted me to chime in. Um, since I've been working with the commission from the beginning. Um, but what Sophie said is exactly correct. Um, staffing is provided to the commission via statute. Um, and in the commission's legislation, it states that um, Bowie State University and the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project uh, would staff the commission and that the Office of the Attorney General um, would provide staff to the commission for the purpose of issuing subpoenas and then as with every um, public body, um, public commission, state commission, um, and even state agencies, of course, they all have assigned assistant attorney generals uh, for the purpose of providing legal advice. So that is really what we are here for, or what we were originally here for, to provide legal advice and to give the commission subpoena power. However, um, we also, 
applied for the grant, the Emmett Till cold case grant on behalf of the commission um, because the grant required that a law enforcement agency apply for it. And so we are also, um, I guess, in charge of oversight of grant administration on behalf of the commission. And that means that we are responsible for overseeing the expenditure of grant funds. And the commission has used its grant funding um, for various procurements, including the historians, the genealogists. Um, and we now have, as um, David Armenti just posted, we have the public relations um, procurement pending that will also be paid with grant funding um, and then as I think most of us know at this point, there's the project manager position, which is also um, supported through the grant funding. And because we hold the grant um, and we are responsible for the administration of the grant, we had to hire the project manager. And so we supervise the project manager position. I think that's the gist of it. Um, I can't think of anything else I missed. And like I said, it, Sophie really covered the majority of it. I just wanted to chime in since I've been around um, for a while and I'm pretty familiar with it at this point, but happy to answer any further questions. Thank you, Kristen and Sophie. That That's very helpful. And I think even, you know, a reiteration for some of our our longstanding commissioners and and collaborators to to get a sense of of those ins and outs um, is definitely very helpful. I, I would also add that you know whether it is the research and geneal genealogical services, the project manager, um, this new position, the new PR and marketing position, they're all gonna they're gonna rely on us as commissioners to guide the process as well. So while it is wonderful to have supporting paid staff, we still need to be the ones that are designing what their responsibilities look like and and collaborate in that process. Um, so you know on a on a basic level, you know, we've been working with Heritage Associates for nearly two years now. So having commissioners participate in the monthly research meetings, having local coalition members participate in the monthly research meetings, as well as these uh, business agenda meetings um, is, is really imperative so that we can set goals and, and make sure that we're moving in the right direction and, and uh, that their work, that their time is productive. So, uh, Please continue to chime in, whether it's you know participating in those meetings or sending those recommendations um, along to us uh, in the committee. Yeah, um, can I just chime in? Yeah, you know, and again, I'm, I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but you know, we we on the commission you know, are, are the ones who are responsible for making sure these hearings happen. And yes, we definitely need all the help and all the support we can get. But here again, you know, yes, we're, we're gearing up and getting ready to start holding hearings, hopefully starting in February with Frederick. Um, more on that later, I'm guessing. But we still have three counties where we do not have local coalitions and where we are going to need to have to take the lead on that. Um, you know, again, I cannot overstate, you know, the value and the the wonderful, you know, support. You know, those, those hearings would not have happened without the the help of the local coalitions of the Maryland Lynch Memorial Project. And so shout out to Will Schwartz, shout out to, to Amy Millen, you know, um, to, to hear since, you know, again, just sort of thinking about the Baltimore uh county one you know coming most immediately to mind but we're gonna need help everybody's gonna have to roll up their their you know sleeves and and start pitching in to figure out how we're gonna do this in the absence of you know 
local coalitions in, in those three counties. So um, this is something that logistically we're going to need to get creative on and hopefully start that sooner than later. Nick, I was just wondering, could you remind us what those three counties were that don't have um, commissions? I can help. Caroline, Calvert, Queen Anne's. Thank you, Will. <laughs> and and I remember well, um, uh, how, uh, Cecil kind of has been working with Hartford, but we really don't have a, a Cecil County buy-in yet. That's as Iris talking. Hey, Maya has her hand raised. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, I was going to say, I we I feel like we've been talking about this forever about which counties don't have a coalition. I agree with Nick. Like the work is going to have to go forward, whether there's a coalition or not. Um, I think the biggest thing is that we probably will just need to figure out securing a location and making sure the community has an invitation. Um, because I feel like <laughs> if we wait for coalition to form, it, the hearings just will not happen. Um, so I, I don't know how the rest of the commissioners feel, but I, I think that we should move forward as though, you know, the hearing is gonna happen. I was just going to ask if if those counties happen to be neighboring um, a county that does have a coalition, is there any thought to maybe combining, um, you know, the, the the counties that don't have one combine their hearing so that we already have like an organized place structure, everything um, that we could expand the the hearing to include the the other county. So I'll give an example, as in Hartford County, we worked with some members of uh, Cecil County. However, we we don't have the certain level of connection and, and, and cooperation of the greater Cecil County and to pull them in and awareness even. And so even though that seems like it would work, I'm not sure. Uh, that it will, it's it that's it's more challenging than you realize. And just a note, I see that Amy Millen has her hand up, and then um, I think Elmore Thompson and another person after her. But I just want to acknowledge Amy. Uh, thank you, Maya. I have a question, and then I think I will probably have a comment. Um. There was talk about uh, Frederick County having their hearing in February. Has a date been confirmed? And have other hearings been established for 2024? Um, we haven't yet set a date for the Frederick hearing. Um, we will be having a meeting with the Frederick Remembrance and Memorial uh, Committee later this week. So hopefully we'll be able to get the date out sooner than later. Thank you, Nick. Um, I just raise it up because um, February is less than two months away and having already gone through the planning and execution of a hearing, it takes quite a while. And, you know, six weeks, eight weeks from now is a very short time span, especially considering the holiday season. Um, and I would really urge that 2024 dates get established and that we need to roll up our sleeves and get to work on doing that. It seems like from month to month we're talking about stuff, but we're not acting upon those conversations. So I would like to um, determine, identify a way to proceed that is thoughtful and intentional. Our clock is ticking. Yeah. 
you said you don't have any representation for Queen Anne's County. Has anyone reached out to any of the organizations or the churches in Queen Anne's County? Because Asbury Green is one of my descendants. Um, I know previously I had spoke with um, the particular church um, to consider writing some information and a grant application that they were going to apply for and with the closer relatives they are now considering talking about the lynching of asbury green i do know where he's interred at um and just reaching out to a particular two churches matter of fact um it might start a conversation where we can get additional information. Although I do have much of the information with Asbury Green's death, where it occurs, the place where he's interred at, but there's kind of closer family members of the Green family that are still alive. Um, they can tell some of some oral histories and may have some documentations as well. So someone needs to reach out to the particular church two churches where the green green descendants are i am a green but it's a couple generations down but i do have that documentation michelle thank you thank you miss thompson i was wondering do does Anyone have your contact information to uh, follow up on that? Oh, I'm sure Maya or Chris or probably Iris, Elizabeth okay. Cruz. I can put my email in the chat, um, my telephone number. But of course, you know, in different counties and all counties, this is a very sensitive thing. Yes. And we like to see familiar faces. So that, you know, the healing process can start, you know, and I, I'm, I'm from Queen Anne's County, but living here in Southern Anne Arundel County. But in order to start that process, we really need to start to try to contact um, the couple of local churches before the older people um, depart this world. And Absolutely. they're leaving. Okay. So I'll put my email in the chat and my telephone number as well. Thank you. And um, and and Chris, I also wanted to ask at our last meeting, you were updating the contact list for um, all of the different counties. Are you able uh, to share that? Or I don't know if you've posted it somewhere. I just don't know how to access it because sure. I think I may no, have been. Not really. I'm sorry. So I, I, I can share that. I, I haven't okay. posted it yet because I was trying to wait for us to get more confirmations on, on individuals who are taking on a different, uh, yeah, and then at that I point we found out that that so uh, Commissioner Mobley had left Reginald Lewis too. But I can post that right now. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I can post it right now. Okay. Nick, did you want to speak to that or or something? Um, no, I was just going to say that you know I would be happy to follow up with Miss Thompson um, to try to figure out you know sort of initial steps. I mean, granted, I'm in California, but you know to the extent that I can help out on that front, you know, remotely, I will be happy to, to do what I can. And maybe this might be a way to, you know, approach the other counties as well, you know, where we've got, you know, kind of the way we, we divvied up the counties, um, you know, amongst the commissioners for, you know, the, the hearings that, that we're trying to do, this might be a way to think about, you know, addressing those. So, you know, I'm happy to, you know, start taking point and if mm -hmm. anybody else wants to join on that front that would be wonderful i should be showing it now hopefully it's it is showing it mm -hmm. is but i just before i'm sorry before before we move on um i do want to acknowledge um hess loves uh comment um as a resident of queen anne's county and also acknowledge that um we did have a scheduled we did have a conversation with uh, Miss Love, and I think, I mean, as as she stated, you know, we we didn't, as a commission, didn't didn't necessarily uh, follow up. So, 
uh, ended up with a distinct next step other than kind of recommending um, some collaboration with the Memorial Project. So I think just noting again for the record that there's another individual who has stepped up and has participated in our monthly meetings and um, has has you know volunteered her time toward on the ground uh, work in Queen Anne's County. So thank you for that comment and thank you for you know your continued uh, contributions. Maybe if I can state this, there's two uh, community centers that may be interested in holding uh, just a um, just a chat and chew session and that would be kennard multicultural heritage center also you have graysonsville community center um, um that would connect with ken island centerville maryland that asbury green lynching um and, and i have connections and family members too as well so i may be able to mention something tomorrow about you know just strike it up and um, see if they'll be willing to have maybe some type of session in in the spring. It's worth a try. Thank you so much for, for offering to help make those connections. Uh, David, I just wanted to mention that earlier on, uh, Reverend Tykert had a question, uh, which I didn't want us to completely uh, get past, which was about the rep the presentation that we had earlier about training for genealogists, I believe. I, I didn't want to leave this page so people could see it, so I haven't gone back to exactly to what she said, but, but it's in the chat, a question that she had earlier. Um. Yes, and that that was a question that that had been lifted up previously, um, and I'm not sure who exactly is the person to answer it. Um, I might ask uh, the, the Office of the Attorney General representatives if they have any more to share about potential training. I, I believe you know dates have not been selected that trainings have not been held amongst the commission but the question is are um, county collaborators potentially also open to participating in in the training opportunities uh, uh, that are made available to commissioners i'll take this one um i uh i am not aware of any condition of the grant that would prohibit us from um, opening it up to our partners in the community. So depending on the subject matter, if you know the commission determines that it would benefit our coalition partners or other partners who are doing this work with us, then yes, we can open it. I think the only um, question would be to ensure that we had, you know, RSVP in the spacing if it were in person um, or Certainly, if it were um, virtual, then that allows for much more flexibility in terms of attendance. But I think as long as we give the presenters a heads up in terms of the um, size of the crowd, then they can adapt accordingly. And again, I, I think our, our next step as a commission is to identify a date or dates in an early 24 that would be conducive for maximum commissioner participation and and then that can be i guess further circulated amongst our partners thank you for that uh, zanita Michelle, right. is this helpful? And Michelle, are you are you you're seeing this now? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I am. It it's a different format than um, last time because I think last time it was the commissioners were um, individually listed next to each county, and now 
it seems like they're more group listed and I guess it's broken up by potential joint hearings. Uh, but, but yes, it is, it's helpful to see. Because I think last time I remember volunteering for a particular county and now it's less clear to me which county I'm responsible for. I think you you had you were you were deferring to see if somebody else was already uh, had already volunteered for it or had already been assigned to because you were new. And, yeah. and, and I would say at this point, <laughs> judging from from our list here, if there's any that you feel a, 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 an affinity to, then I would I can't imagine anyone here would be. Oh, no, you cannot do that. I mean, we, we have you up here. I guess. Right. And so what I'm saying is on that in that first grouping where I am, sure. there's three counties and it's less clear to me which of those three I'm responsible for or all or all three of us listed responsible for all three. That's just the, the point I'm confused on. Y yes. Generally speaking, how, how we have this put together is that we, the initial goal was that we had I mean, 18 commissioners and each commissioner would be paired with another commissioner to take on a county or counties. So it, it was it's never supposed to be just one commissioner to a county. And sometimes it, it, it appears it has become that way. But okay. ideally, ideally it is supposed to be more than one commissioner for any county or grouping thereof. Okay. So like in that first section, uh uh, the chair, Davidson, and myself would be all responsible for those three right. counties. Now, Allegheny's already had his hearing, so you wouldn't have to, I mean, except for maybe what, whatever might come okay. up. So really just Calvert and St. Mary's. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to leave this right now because I think somebody has a question, but I can't see. Okay. Is, is there a place, um, is there like a common uh, Google Drive? Is there a place where we can access this later or do we just need to wait for you to email it? I can I can give, well, the only problem, I can give access to anyone who has an EDU and or a Google or a Gmail. No, it has to be an EDU or a state email. Unfortunately, that's how it is. Now, what I want to do is give is put this onto our, our MLTRC main website. But I'm just trying to wait for it to be right. completed is what I've been doing. So I got yeah, it. That makes sense. Okay. So it looks like the place where we still do need volunteer commissioners is the Caroline Kent and, and Queen Anne's. Um, have you been reaching out to people directly or, or um, to fill that spot? Or how are we going to go about getting commissioners on that block? I'll leave that open to... Uh, I, I think if I could um, just share, like, because we've seen, like, a couple of rollovers for people who were assigned to those counties. I think that there just hasn't been a reassignment of a commissioner to those counties. If that's helping to answer the question. Like, we've had, I, we've had, like, three representatives from Measurement of Lewis at this point, I believe, three or four. So that is kind of an inconsistent seat. Maybe, maybe if you sent an email out with this information and, and let commissioners know we're still looking for volunteers for these three, maybe we could get it filled in. Yeah. Um, here again, I, you know, I'll just go out on, you know, put it out there and I'll just say, I'm happy to, you know, work with folks, you know, or to sort of be one of the point people for Queen Anne's since that seems to be, you know, it's like we, we've got somebody, you know, in the room and, um, you know, I'm, again, from afar willing to work, you know, however I can. And maybe we should ask, you know, if there are other commissioners who are willing to work with the other two to at least get the ball rolling on those uh, counties. And again, it sounds like, you know, we have... No, Cecil is one that's already working with Harford. Scratch that. Um, but yeah, if we can get other folks to kind of help take point and start that that ball rolling, um, that would be wonderful. So I'll just throw that out there again.
and just in terms of updating, um, I think Kirkland Hall is going to be removed from Somerset, so uh, Marshall Stevenson will likely need to be paired up with someone else as well for Somerset. Thank you, Maya. Amy also asked, is assignment of commissioners to counties something the logistics committee can take on? I think that may have been a task originally of the logistics committee. Um, I, I mean, I would also offer that perhaps the commission chair and vice chair should should also put, you know, have a hand in, in redistributing and you know, if not assigning, at least asking before assigning. Yeah, I you know, have, asking for volunteers. Not to um, interject, David, but I was gonna say, um, I don't mind it being a, um, a task with the um, logistic committee, but it hadn't been originally. Originally, commissioners signed up for the counties for which they either lived in or had an, um, expressed interest. Like I, in, I kind of inherited Montgomery and Howard based on Tim Baker having a seat for me, um, and so. I think that we we should. Um, I, I would be happy to take this on to the logistics committee to get those vacant areas filled. But just before people kind of just raise their hand, and then where there was a vacancy for a commissioner, someone would come up in and say that they can assist in a specific set of towns. That that's that is exactly. I concur with what Maya said. I think at the beginning, it was we were all taking ones that we thought were at least somewhat akin to where where our our geography put us, and then I think on the last go round when we were looking at this with, with Chair Fukunle, is that he wanted us to volunteer via emails he was going to put forth to uh, as reminders to us. And I I think, and, I, I, and he can certainly correct me when he is back with us, I think he was getting, at, he was at the point of assigning if people did not come forward to actually take on on counties, he was the next move would be that okay, I'm going to assign you to this or this and, and, and the other. So it was, it was, I think we were in that direction with the last uh, go round. So having said that, is anybody wants to volunteer for any of these right now? Since we since <laughs> since we're since we brought it up. Again, I think that this is something I understand the importance of um, volunteering and and connecting interest with um, a project or assignment. But I feel like this kind of conversation has been going on for at least two plus years. And um, to the most recent point that Eleanor um, just made in the chat, I, we do need to think about the sensitivity. And there's a reason why some of the counties don't have uh coalitions to the maryland lynching memorial project and so it's it's really important to have that thoughtfulness and the intentionality behind making assignments and making the connections and so it's frustrating for me as a new commissioner and somebody who has attended the here these meetings for for a long time to be repeating these conversations again Yeah, I, I conditionally um, volunteered at the last meeting and I was just kind of waiting to see if a call was going to go out for commissioners who weren't able to attend the meeting to see if they had any interest. Um, since I am on the Calvert St. Mary's one as well. And so I don't want to, um, you know, take opportunities from uh, from other people. But if if we could find out from the commissioners that aren't able to attend, if there's any interest and then, you know, and then and then see what's left i think would be good
so Chris, it sounds like we do have some conditional right. volunteers that can plug in there um, and continue that conversation with other, you know, individuals that attended the meeting here. But I, I mean, I guess my my recommendation too would be to put this to further further put this to the chair and vice chair or something to redistribute with you know some uh, deadlines attached to it and but it but it sounds like at least um some of those conversations can can uh, move forward no i agree i think i'll get with commissioner davis and 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 as she's as mentioned within logistics looking at this further and we will explore it with uh with even commissioner thompson too with her thoughts about queen anne county and uh, get back with the the chair and vice chair about it as well thank you i think roger davidson has raised his hand chris hi right, go ahead roger i didn't see you yeah not a problem um i have no problem volunteering on, on one level, but uh, I have mobility issues from a prolonged illness. So getting to the actual place during the hearing is, is, is problematic, but all the things leading up to the hearing, I can work with uh, someone on those counties. I, I didn't attend Allegheny, but I was uh, uh, with with uh, uh, Chair Fakunle working on that uh, with, with the uh, people there. So um, if I can fill in, I'm here at Prince George's County, and I was hoping um, that we could, you know, have that hearing at Bowie State. I, I know uh, 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 Nick had mentioned that, but I'd be happy to work with uh, 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 Simone Barrett with uh, Prince George's County, and I know one or two of their people. So um, I, I am open, but I, I just wouldn't be able to be on site uh, if, if needed. That's very good, Roger. I mean, I, I, Maya and I are both Prince George's County residents, and we're actually a part of that group specifically. So I, I would think that with that going forward, that one, if not both of us, would be able to attend that hearing. All right, sounds good. All right, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in PG as well. Uh, okay. And so I can get around Prince George's is trying to get okay. to the place. <laughs> yeah. Great. And Dr. Barnes also offered in the chat that Harford and Cecil could be in September. Um, so perhaps that's uh, just another note for uh, the OAG as, as related to the project manager onboarding. Um, I mean, all of us commissioners for sure, but you know, just to have that, that note um, as well as the logistics committee um, as a potential target for, for 2024. And also noted about the necessary runway um, and the essential role of the project manager in getting any hearing off the ground. Um, as, as Dr. Creary mentioned, we have a conversation with the Frederick Coalition. I think it's tomorrow. Uh, we don't have a date. And if we still don't have a date, you know, it's, it, it, you know, we definitely need to look closely at whether February is feasible even though I know that's what we would like to get something going in the early part of the year. That's, that's correct. Okay, David, I'm good with this for now. So I believe that was getting us through basically the new business, uh, but also some some committee report alignment there. Uh, the at this point in the agenda, we are at announcements um, or new for new business, so to speak. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Hughes. 
I didn't know quite where to put this in the agenda. So I just wanted to make folks aware because at the last meeting, we talked about the RFP that needed to go out for the marketing and PR specialists to assist with getting the word out about the hearings and driving more public um, participation with the, the website and so forth. And um, uh, Lindsay Baker stepped in uh, to volunteer as well to work with OAG to get the RFP um, out there. So I'm pleased to, to note that it has now been posted and it can be found on the State Archives uh, website for the, the commission as well as on the OAG site and Emma, which is the state um, clearinghouse <coughs> procurements. And uh, thanks to members of the executive committee who provided some feedback and finalizing the RFP. It closes on December 28th. So please, if you know of folks who might have an interest and have expertise in this area, drive them to that um, procurement site. We're accepting questions from potential vendors up until I think the 15th. Um, and thanks for help from those of you who've, who've helped me to respond to those questions. There will be um, a review and rating and ranking of vendor proposals in early January and Commissioner Creary and Commissioner Snowden have volunteered to help with that rating and ranking with the idea that we would want to move very quickly in making a selection. Um, so that's where that RFP um, and procurement action stands at this time. Thank you for that. Yes, we have uh, Nick and then Amy. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, one of the other things that I know we kind of need to think about uh, what with four, is it four new commissioners or, you know, basically almost a quarter of the, the commission is new. Um, so we need to think about, and I know we had talked about this either at the last meeting or the meeting before that, but, you know, talking about committee structure. And again, I, at this point, I don't think it would be beneficial to rethink the entire structure of the committees, but we need to get the new commissioners on the committee so that, you know, we can get them involved in that work. Um, for example, I've lost two members of the Reconciliation Committee, um, and it would be nice to get some more hands on deck um, if if that is at all possible. So, um, you know, got any volunteers out there, um, I, I'd be happy to, to have some help. Well, um, I'm glad you're saying that because that's the conversation I've been having in my head. I've reached out while we're on this meeting to Amy, because I know she's expressly interested in the hearings moving forward um, by email to ask about her joining the logistics team. Lindsay Baker as well. And Lindsay Baker has agreed to come on my committee, not to say that you can't have any other people, but I'm just, I just want to share with the public. That's, that's okay, because I already put dibs out on, on um, Michelle Coles. So, you know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I also lost a couple of people too. Thank you. Yeah. Amy? I'm just going oh, to say this. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have a non commission uh, announcement. This is for the Maryland Lynching Memorial Project. The Baltimore County Coalition is hosting its fifth annual January Community Forum, which is a free public event. We're going to be screening the film Eroding History and have the full panel of filmmakers um, in attendance. It's on January 3rd at 10 a.m. Um, being hosted by the Park School. And um, I think that Will Schwartz might have the link for registration and information. If not, I'll be searching for it's that in, in a moment. It's Perfect. In, it's in Perfect. Thank you. It's a great opportunity to come together in conversation with um, members of both the Baltimore County as well as across the state. So thank you. Michelle. 
So um, let's, this is going to the reconciliation committee that um, Nick was just talking about. And I just, I had a question and, and to, as a caveat, I'm new. And so I don't have as much historical knowledge of what has taken place and what has been discussed. Um, and I understand that a lot of the focus on the commission has been on the, the truth finding aspect and having the hearings in the counties uh, focused on, um, you know, uncovering the lynchings that took place there. And I was just wondering if the commission has given any thought to holding a hearing uh, exclusively focused on what reconciliation would look like. And um, so it wouldn't be a county focused hearing, but, uh, uh, you know, Maryland wide um, bringing in legal as experts, historian experts, um, you know, uh, reconciliation experts just to sort of uh, talk about and think about the recommendations that we would be ultimately making focused on reconciliation. I love the idea. Um, I don't know that we have thought about that per se. I know we had, you know, back in the before times, um, you know, we had talked about having specific hearings dealing with media. And I think the other sort of non county specific ones uh, we had talked about, I think, you know, sort of looking at government uh, involvement. Um, but I think one dealing specifically with reconciliation would be fantastic. Um, I know there are probably a whole lot of people that we could pull in um, to do that. But I think that, yes, I mean, I've certainly tried to at every hearing make sure that in some way we're trying to address the question of what should reconciliation, what should accountability look like. Um, but I think having a specific hearing dedicated to those questions entirely would be would be wonderful. And if you're willing to join the Reconciliation Commission we, uh, Committee, we can kind of start uh, hammering that out if, you know, the the commission is is up for it. Yeah, I, th I thought I'd already accepted your offer, Nick. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, now it's official. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sophie? Um, yes, so I just wanted to uh, give a gentle reminder of the BGA training. I know we had initially uh, discussed maybe doing it in November or December, and that time has passed. So just if the commissioners can start thinking through, do you want to do a full day training? They're, they pretty much have um, set, they have, we can set the agenda so we can do it as a full day we can do it as a two-day training we can break it up but just kind of getting an idea of what the commissioners want to do and when uh the commission would like to look into doing that so we can get that process rolling nick uh yes um just an FYI, sort of an announcement, and I just put in the, the chat, the University of Maryland College Park uh, social data um, mini grant series is going to be doing a presentation tomorrow um, at noon on, you know, research that they've been doing on lynchings from 1789 to 1960. Um, it's sort of a big metadata kind of presentation. Um, a former student of mine from Bowie State is going to be on the panel, and they've asked me to comment on it. Not that I'm doing it for you know gratuitous self promotion, but I think you know they've they've got some really fascinating uh, research that they've done that I think you know, will definitely have bearing on uh, the, the research that we're doing. So the registration link is in the is in the chat. Hopefully, you all can make it. Um, I will be sufficiently caffeinated to, to get going for a, for a 9 a.m. start, you know, my time. So, but that's noon in, in Maryland. So just putting that out there, hopefully some of you will be able to join. Roger. Thank you. I know we have to go and I just want, and I came in late. I apologize for that at other meeting. But as we go through this and we're talking about the lynchings, I hope we keep in mind that the lynchings were just a part of a much larger issue. Uh, this belonged to my parents. Oh, we can't look here. 
white, colored. They were, uh, the trauma that they lived with stayed with them for their lives. Growing up in D.C. on the edge of Prince George's County with the things that were going here, that this is after the lynchings. I was afraid to come in here, the legal lynchings. There were a lot of murders. And so the trauma is still there in these communities, both on um, black and white communities. I went to a, a Catholic school called St. John's. It was mostly white, military Catholic school. And I'm 62. I have a couple of classmates who, um, you know, I try to love on them, but that 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 issue is still with them as far as the same kind of, um, I don't want to call it hatred, but that's what it is, that could lead to any kind of lynching or murder. I don't know why I still talk with these guys, but uh, I do, <laughs> a couple of them. So as we think of reconciliation, and, and Nick is the man for it, I, I hope we can touch some hearts and minds. Because like I said, this, Right here, stayed with them till their death. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Roger. I mean, definitely a, a poignant reminder, you know, especially as we have, you know, we have that dialogue in these communities. Um, just to, I mean, just to lift up Sophie's reminder again, um, I think I think that needs a another email redistribution so that uh, commissioners know what we're talking about. Um, you know, tapping into the the training opportunities and perhaps you know a doodle poll to to really lock down dates that. A majority of folks can can participate in because, like you said, we're not we're our, we're almost at the end of the year now. So if we don't if we don't set that soon, it's probably not going to happen anytime um, in the first month of the year. Um, so yeah, we we definitely need to keep that at the top of the list. Uh, any other announcements from commissioners or the public at this time? I have a question. Um, so do you want me to send the email to all of the commissioners with a doodle poll or the executive team first and then go from there? Maybe it starts, had... Yeah, maybe it starts with the executive team. I'm not I'm not remembering exactly what the initial outreach was. I, I thought it went to everybody at first and maybe it just didn't get responses. Um, okay. I, yeah, I think we I think we should look back on what that first outreach effort attempt looked like and Maybe and then in terms of just the general consensus, because that might not be able to be captured by doodle poll. Do commissioners want to do a full day, two days, like in thinking it through now, if you could just, if you don't have an answer now, if you could just email me and let me know. Um, it's hard to do the doodle poll with options without knowing what the training length is going to be. So if you could just send me that information or if you want to put it in the chat, like what your preference is, we can just go with the majority and then they'll build out the training based on our needs. So again, any commissioner still on the call, uh, please either put in the chat uh, for the OAG, Sophie's uh, reference for moving forward with next steps, full day or multiple partial day preference and or uh, email follow up with her.
So at this time, unless there are any other announcements or new business, uh, we'll allow time just for folks to fill in their preference in the chat if they so choose. But otherwise, uh, do we have a motion for adjournment? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Michelle. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to hold up adjournment. Um, I, I just don't think I have enough information about what's supposed to take place in the training to form an opinion on how long it should take. Um, is this a training you guys have done before? C can you describe it in a little more detail? So I'm trying to find the initial email, but it's essentially a training on restorative justice. Uh, they created a draft agenda of what the training would entail. It would entail breakout sessions, presentations. So when I send the email um, requesting dates, I will find that draft agenda and put it in there. So you'll have an idea of the types of information they'll be offering. Thank you. And has it already been determined if it'll be virtual or in person, or is that still flexible as well? I believe it will be virtual. Um, Chris, Kristen, are you still on? I, I'm not sure if they even offered an in-person option. Um, I think it will just be virtual. OK, great. Thank you. I'm here. I, I don't know either. Um, I, maybe Zanita has more information, and you can check with her and then include that in the email. So I, I just don't know. OK. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All Second. right. Appreciate everybody's time. Uh, 1 12 p.m. We will adjourn. Uh, and we've got a couple of uh, follow ups coming by email. So uh, keep an eye out and, and let's let's keep things moving. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Thank Happy you, David. Holidays. Thank you, everyone.